<laughs> you guys are great. <laughs> well, thank you for, for having me here. It is always so fun to be with you guys, who many of you I feel like are um, have become friends, because I do get to come at least once a year, which is great. So thanks for having me back. Um, we are going to be talking about emotional intelligence, so EQ. And it's been actually a quite, it's been kind of a rising topic, if you will, for the past two decades, I would say, um, not just in the field of psychology, but just in general. Um, and so to get us primed to be thinking about emotional intelligence, and we're going to be talking about how do we cultivate it in our kids, I want you guys to do a little self-assessment, if you will. So I'm going to put up some questions here. It's a little quiz for you, but don't worry, I won't be grading it. This is just for you to be thinking about your own emotional intelligence. These are just uh, a question. So I'll be quiet. Normally you would just take this. It would be strongly disagree through strongly agree. Just read through these and kind of rate yourself, if you will, on how many you agree with or disagree with. Okay, so hopefully that primes the pump and you're just reading through and learning a little bit about, well, what are some of the things that we need to measure for for emotional intelligence? So we're going to talk about, I mean, the main thing we're talking about today is, well, how do we raise children that are emotionally intelligent? We certainly all know IQ is important, right? The head smart, but what about heart smart? Um, and how do we cultivate it in our homes? But we're going to obviously need to define it first. And before I even define it and get to the meat of the presentation, I want to talk briefly about why this has been such an increasingly important topic. What some societal trends and changes have been that have brought this to the forefront of clinicians and researchers' minds. So let's look at some of these trends. There was, I'm going to give you some research studies here just to let you know, hey, this is why it's so important. So bear with me through the research. I always think it's important um, for us to kind of be mindful of it. So there was a random sample nationwide of 2,000 American children, and they were rated by their parents and teachers. And what they found is that over the past two decades, children on average are dropping in basic emotional and basic social skills. Additionally, they found that today, children become more anxious, moody, depressed, impulsive, lonely, and disobedient more than they did even 10 to 20 years ago. Now, behind this, many um, researchers and clinicians think there are some larger forces behind this trend of the fact that our kids aren't as socially and emotionally skilled today. So one of the forces perhaps is new economic realities are making it so that parents have to work harder and often longer hours to support their families. I don't know if anybody's read Juliet Shore's uh, The Overworked American. It's a fantastic book. She's a Harvard economics professor. And she has some fascinating studies in there that speak to the fact that the typical American family now works 1,000 more hours than we did 15 to 20 years ago. One survey showed that Americans have one third less free time than we did 20 years ago. So as a result, findings are showing that we are spending less time on some of the basics, eating, sleeping, and then yes, spending time with our kids and just playing and relaxing. Another result of being pressed for time is that we have found that we're less, families are less invested in community activities as well as religious activities. And yet, certainly everyone here knows these things are what upholds the family structure and the backbone of our families. We also know that today, many of us live farther from relatives, and many of us are in neighborhoods where we might not allow our kids just to go out on the street and play by themselves. And more than anything, one of the biggest social changes is that we see more and more time that kids are spending interacting and playing, if you will, in front of a screen. And so they're not outside interacting and playing with other kids. Another fascinating study that was reported recently in early childhood quarterly research found that the, what they did is they surveyed kindergarten teachers across the U.S. And they asked these teachers, what's one of the number one problems that you see in your kindergarten classrooms today? And it wasn't that 
kids didn't know their shapes or they, weren't, they didn't know their phonics or their numbers. It was actually that kids did not know how to calm themselves down and they were quick to have tempers. It's what we call, psychologists call, kids do not know how to emotionally self-regulate. And so this was once again, this nationwide sample in the US, kindergarten teacher saying, oh no, we're not worried about reading or writing or arithmetic, the three R's, we're worried that kids don't know how to manage their tempers, they escalate quickly, then they don't know how to calm themselves down, so that's self-regulation. So in some ways it seems that the net effects of some social changes are actually increasing, are, are putting our kids at risk, right? There's an increased risk to our children based on some of these social changes that we see today. Now here's the thing, you guys might be sitting here thinking, and I imagine many of you are sitting here thinking, well, I am so blessed and fortunate that I have a flexible work schedule, or maybe I don't even I don't work outside of the home. Um, so I'm not. I do spend a lot of time with my husband and my kids, and I get lots of sleep. Which, if anyone's saying that, I want to know your trick for that one. <laughs> um, you might also be thinking, I've, I, "We're so blessed. We have family. We have relatives nearby. We, we're here at church, so we're part of communities, and we should." truly celebrate that you all, this group, in some ways, some of these trends don't apply to you because you probably do limit screen time. You've got support nearby. You're part of a church community. But let me say this, and I think this is why it applies to all of us, even if some of these societal trends don't impact your family immediately, is that I work with so many well-intentioned and well-educated parents in my private practice who I think all of us in some sense have then inherited some tradition of discounting children's feelings simply because they're smaller, they're less powerful, they're less experienced, and let's admit they're less rational than we are. I want to show you guys just for fun to a quick video about how kids, it's only a minute as you can see, but kids are definitely less rational than we are. You can't lift that up? No! I'll come back and try again. You're almost to the sink. That looks like it's very heavy. I think you can do it though, Kirsten. I think you can lift it up to the sink. And you can help clear the table. Your big hammy couldn't do it, but you could do it. Oh. You want to try again? Maybe you take your thumb out of your mouth and move your lovey and you can do it all. Okay, let's go. Put it in the sink. at different at times um, and so that's just really it get, gives a good laugh because at times we either you have to either laugh at that or at some days we cry at it and we're like ah just work with me right um, so but this notion of so once again even if the social changes and these trends don't seem to be super applicable to you this notion that we I think have in America inherited this tradition of at times discounting kids feelings just because once again they're smaller, they're less experienced, they're less powerful, clearly they are less rational. Um, at times we can even laugh at their anger or ignore their cries for help and I you know or just kind of be even more so than that be dismissive or invalidating of what they're telling us and let me just give you an example that I um, think is so powerful of a very precocious four-year-old when I was with him and I, I call everyone either Johnny or Sally so don't try to figure out necessarily who this family is but they're a family like us and so little four-year-old Johnny and his parents were in my office and he had been recently having more nightmares and night terrors and waking up in the middle of the night so two or 3 or 4 a.m. I'm scared. Oh my gosh, look at that. Yikes. You know, it's a big monster, scary thing. And they, once again, well-educated, well-intended parents, a family like mine or like yours. But often what they were saying, and let's give them credit, it was 3 a.m., was, oh, there's nothing to be scared of. There's nothing here. Go back to sleep. You're fine. 
there's nothing to be scared of. Pretty normal response, right? I mean, you guys are like, yeah, I would say that. Nothing to be scared of. I'll never forget little Johnny. He turned and he looked at me and he said, well, Dr. G, they must not have very good eyes because they're not seeing what I'm seeing. Which was fabulous and kind of to the point of, we were actually, we're, that's dismissive. You're fine, go back to sleep. There's nothing to be scared of. For him, there was a lot to be scared of, right? And so this tradition at times of just kind of discounting or invalidating. In that point, we're dismissing what our children are at times telling us. And it, we know that if we routinely kind of are dismissive or invalidate their feelings, what happens is that kids learn to doubt their own judgment. They also lose confidence in themselves. And more than that, they're going to stop coming to us. And let me tell you, in junior high and high school, we want them coming to us. We want them being able to tell us what they're feeling. But if we continue down the road of, oh, you're fine. There's nothing to be scared of, right? As opposed to, oh, my goodness. Oh, that, that seems so scary. Sometimes my little one, Madeline, used to, when she was a bit younger, wake up and just feel really frightened. And I, you know, and it would be two or three in the morning. But even just a line of, and what I would tell these parents, of just, oh, Oh, it's so scary to be scared. I hate being scared. Even that, I mean, I can't, you know, you can't think of much at two in the morning when you're getting woken up at times, right? But just, oh, it's so scary to be scared, isn't it? So just by saying, oh, I hear you, you're scared. And it is hard and not fun to be scared is different from, you're fine, go back to sleep, there's nothing to be scared of, right? When it's like, wait a second. So if we, so it's this idea of what does it look like to not be dismissive and not invalidate our kids' feelings? Because we want them to, one, come to us, we want them to have confidence and to actually um, not doubt their judgment about what they're seeing or feeling. Now, here's the great news. So despite these societal changes and trends, as parents, we have an incredible opportunity to be emotion coaches for our kids. We truly have an opportunity to shape their brain, if you will. There's increasing research that shows when kids feel heard and respected and valued at home, they do better in school, they have more friendships, and they live healthier and more successful lives. And not only that, when they feel your support and love, they actually are protected from threats of youth violence, from premature sexual activity, from adolescent suicide and antisocial behavior. Clearly, we want our kids protected from that, and we want them to thrive and do well in school and have more friends. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we homes, but before we talk about how we cultivate it, let's talk about what exactly is it. So real quickly, four components of emotional intelligence. Um, and this is taken, actually the two books that I had up here, I would highly recommend. So John Gottman's Raising an Emotionally Intelligent Child, very user friendly, reader friendly, it's just fantastic for parents. It's not too jargony or researchy. So that's the Gottman book. And then Daniel Goleman. So he is kind of the researcher and psychologist who pioneered um, and really put EQ on the map. And actually, when I'm defining emotional intelligence right now, I'm using Goleman's four components, which is really the most widely used um, in the field. So the first component of EQ is self-awareness. And this is when you know your own internal states, you can recognize your own emotions, and you have a sense of your self-worth and your capabilities, right? So knowing your own internal states, recognizing your own emotions, having a sense of your self-worth and capabilities. So that's the self-awareness. The second component is self-management. So if we're self-aware, which is great, can we then manage our internal states and even negative ones? Can we keep disruptive emotions at bay when we need to? Are we flexible in handling change? Are we persistent in pursuing our goals despite obstacles? And then we're acting congruently with our values. And so that's self-management, right? So it goes beyond the self-awareness. It's a second component saying, hey, when you're feeling stressed or having disruptive emotions, do we know how to manage that? Can we keep it at bay? Can you persist in a goal even if there's an obstacle in front of you? The third component is empathy and social awareness. So this is then sensing other people's feelings and perspectives and taking an active interest in them. Right? I think of this as simply perspective taking. 
right? Howard Gardner, who has a, um, multiple theories of intelligence, he talks about this as people smart, right? So can we be aware of what that other person is feeling? Quick story about that. When my oldest, Kate, was about 18 months old, very, very verbal. Both of my kids were quite verbal. My poor husband thought it was a little too verbal. That, and I thought, well, I'm talking to them a lot. I know the research about language development. So I would often explain what we were doing. So when Kate was 18 months old, I remember this very distinctly. Madeline wasn't even born yet. I was quite pregnant. We had just gotten a new washing machine and dryer. Top of the line. I was thrilled for it. We had moved into our um, new home. And I remember we had had it for about a month. And I was in the laundry room, and all of a sudden, you know, it's a fancy one, all the buttons. I was pushing a button, and I am kind of leaned down. Kate wasn't in the room by me, but she was down the hall, and she could actually see me, little did I know. And I was thinking, and it wasn't working, essentially. The washing machine wasn't working. And I'm like, you've got to be joking. We just paid a ton of money for this. What in the world? And I'm sure I'm not somebody who, you know, becomes incredibly demonstrative, but I just, my face, I was just kind of pushing, and I was probably muttering under my breath, like, you've got to be joking. What in the world? And this isn't working. And so Kate kind of, you know, tiles up to me, and she says, Mama, you fustated? <laughs> 18 months old. And I looked, and my husband heard it, and he just, and I said, yeah, sweetie, I am frustrated. Right, you can barely say the word well, but this is that idea of social awareness. And Thomas looked at me, and he said, she is the daughter of a psychologist, isn't she? <laughs> Most 18 months old probably couldn't name somebody else's emotion, let alone frustrated, and I definitely was, right? So empathy and social awareness, and that kind of, Gives a quick story about what that is. The last component, relationship management. So this is not just perspective taking, but this is the skill to bring out a desirable response in others. So this is when you not only can see somebody else's need, but you can bolster their abilities. So you can inspire individuals and groups. Now here's the thing, unlike IQ, IQ has always gotten a lot of attention in the research, and IQ is one single number. EQ is getting a lot more attention, but we know it really is these four components. And what I just say about that is somebody could have amazing self-confidence and amazing self-awareness, but absolutely no empathy, and we would not consider them to be emotionally intelligent. So it's not one single kind of factor here like IQ is. It's these four components all taken together. We could say, oh, we're really high on the self-awareness and kind of maybe even perspective taking, but we're quite dismissive and we don't know how to calm ourselves down. We can't manage ourselves, right? So you could still be high on two, not on others, and we would say, well, you, we're, we would not consider that necessarily high emotional intelligence. So in gist, when we look at EQ, it is, I like to think Think of it as people skills, social skills, and self skills, right? It's a basic trust in emotions and social relationships. It's an ability to self-regulate, to recognize your own feelings, to control your own feelings. It's also an ability to recognize other people's feelings and to understand and work even with other people's negative feelings. So these things we know and research shows us are vital for life. And here's the thing. EQ, the foundation is laid in childhood, and research shows us that over and over again. As young kids develop, their early emotional experiences literally become embedded in the architecture of the brain, which is actually fascinating, this research. Right, are you guys either like grimacing like, oh no? <laughs> it's scary. It is a little scary, isn't it? I mean, I, I often, no, no, we can always, we're going to talk about, no, we're going to talk about repair. You don't say that. Um, but it is, I do think, and I, I knew this before I actually worked at times with Jack Shonkoff when I was in Boston at Harvard Med School. I worked with a lot of these people, and this is when I was in my 20s, not married, not even really thinking about kids, and barely thinking about marriage at that point. In Boston, it wasn't strange to be mid to late 20s and be single. You just had your urban tribe, and many of us were in grad school. I came here, and that was a different story, but we can talk about that at a different time. <laughs> I wanted to wear a sign at Westmont saying, I'm single, content, and just fine with it. Like, everyone was trying to set me up on a blind date. It was wild. Anyway, you can, Autumn can attest, it's quite different on the East Coast versus the West Coast. But um, we, and I remember in my 20s when I learned this, when I was with Jack Sean Koff and Ed Tronic, and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, parenting, what a huge responsibility. And it sounded terrifying, right? And, and here's, it is a huge responsibility. It's also one of the most amazing privileges ever. And the most important work I think we will do, especially when we start knowing the research about neuroplasticity. So let me tell you that we know, thanks to brain science, that a child's brain goes through amazing periods of growth. 
And one period of growth is truly early childhood, birth to three, birth to five, but birth to three even more so. And we know that our brain gets sculpted during that time, and it's not just the neurons that are connecting, which is all happening during that time physiologically. The reason that our brain is um, connecting and neurons are connecting is truly based on our experiences. So what experience we have is what helps our neurons to connect. When they wire together, they fire together, the brain prunes away. It's known as neuroplasticity, which is essentially is saying our brain is modifiable due to our experience. And research shows that in the most incredible ways, really fascinating ways, studies that have been done. Unfortunately, a lot of these studies are done when there's been trauma, abuse, and neglect. Um, that we go in after the fact and we see, oh, the brain literally didn't wire together because they were deprived of this, right? And so it's during this time of early childhood that environmental influences on brain growth are incredibly powerful in shaping a child's emotional and social neural, neural circuits. We know and research shows us that kids who are well nurtured and whose parents, because initially, we've got to help our kids calm down. A no two-year-old can often just calm themselves down on their own. So, but parents who go in, help them, calm them, literally hold them, and nurture them, they seem to actually develop greater strength in brain circuitry than kids who are not nurtured and cared for and supported. So as parents, in other words, we have an opportunity to create an environment that lets kids' brains function at their best. We also see that emotional intelligence, and when we, and we're about to talk about what are some things that we can do, but we see when we actually tune into kids, our corpus callosum, which is the um, collection of nerve fibers that separate our right and left, hemi left hemisphere, literally are built when parents are emotionally attuned and responsive to kids when they are, especially at a young age, not able to regulate their own emotions. So, Let's talk about then, knowing that it's so important, I'm just going to get to the heart. We have about 10 minutes left, so we'll go through this and have time for Q&A. What do we do? How do we cultivate EQ in our homes? Um, so I'm going to just give you some things that I think that are research-backed, but also come a lot from my clinical practice and then just from personal experience. The first thing I would say is practice it yourself. Practice emotional engagement and attunement. It is so incredibly important for you to be able to name your feelings. And by the way, not just your good feelings, if you will. I mean, I put good in quotes because I would say all feelings are good. But I think, unfortunately, somehow we have learned there are certain negative or bad ones, which is not the case. But we sometimes pass that down to our kids as well, that oh, it's not OK to be angry or it's not OK to be jealous. Actually, all feelings are OK. Now, all behaviors are not OK. It's because you're angry doesn't mean you can go and whop somebody in the face or do whatever, you know, push them down. All feelings are OK. Let your kids hear you say, ah, I, had, I had a bad day. I'm just sad or I'm frustrated because of x, y, and z. Practice it. These two things go hand in hand. Practicing emotional engagement and modeling for your kids, right? Modeling by being honest with your feelings. Sometimes I have definitely seen, and I've had young adults report to me that literally their mom or dad would say, no, I'm fine. I'm totally fine. That's not actually emotional engagement. I mean, that's not honest, right? Because all of it, and that's a very mixed message that is very confusing for children. You know, we're kind of, I'm, 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 I mean, even if you're in a fight with somebody and they're watching you, by the way, if you're fighting with your spouse and say, is, instead say, ah, no, I am frustrated. I'm just so upset. Or let them see you. It's okay for them to see you cry. And then you can say, you know what, but it's okay because mommy can handle her feelings, right? So we want to practice the emotional engagement and attunement. We want to be honest with our feelings and be truthful so kids know all feelings are okay. Now, Jesus experienced all feelings, by the way. Jesus got angry, right? I think sometimes in the church we give the message, especially that it's not okay to be angry. No, it actually is okay to be angry, and our kids need to know that, and our kids need to know that we can handle their incredibly intense and extreme emotions. I have had one about 23-year-old who said to me, um, he's very emotionally kind of closed off, and I would say emotionally constipated is a word I sometimes use, and, um, and things have been hard, and he won't let himself at all even get tears in his eyes. He just stops himself, and he said, well, because when I cried when I was a little kid, when I was told by my, by my dad, 
boys don't cry. Like, boys are wimpy if you do that, right? Like, suck it up. And then he said, but when I cried, so then I thought, well, at least my mom I can cry in front of, but she would start crying and kind of not just start crying, she would start losing her composure, right? And so he then learned, okay, well, my mom can't handle it either, so I better just never cry because I'm either a sissy or I'm overwhelming my mom, right? I just, so she can't handle it. So I've just got to learn to kind of suck it up. We want our kids to know that, yeah, they can cry to us and they can see us get tears in our eyes. And then if they, if they get worried, you can say, oh, honey, I just, I love you so much that my heart hurts when yours hurts. But you know what? I can handle it. And I want you to tell me these things. And so let's talk about strategies, right? If you're somebody who's very sensitive and might get teary in front of your kids more often than others, that's okay as long as it doesn't overwhelm them and as long as you can back it up with, mommy can handle this. You know, mommy just sometimes gets teary too because all feelings are okay. Right, so practice it ourselves, model it, kids are watching us. Social learning theory, really, the, the gist of that is monkey see, monkey see. You don't realize how much they're watching you, but they are watching you all the time, right? And the classic research that came out in 1973 by Albert Bandura still holds true today. People have actually tried to disprove his theory, particularly people who make violent video games and violent movies have tried to disprove his theory, and we can't, right? Because his theory is no actually watching violence or watching pro-social, whichever it is. If you watch violence, you're more likely to act violent or act aggressive. And the same is true if we're watching pro-social behavior and altruistic behavior, we're more likely to act that way. So it's important for kids to see us um, modeling emotional engagement and attunement. Okay, the third is explicitly teach it. Explicitly teach emotional intelligence. Kids don't have the words, especially young kids don't always have the words for the way that they're feeling. So when you look at them, a great principle that I learned from Barry Brazelton um, was use the behavior of the child as your language. By the way, this is great for young kids. This is amazing for adolescents who constantly feel like they have to be on the defense with their parents and constantly feel judged by their parents. So just use their behavior. In other words, if they're sitting back, I don't know, you, you look like you're frustrated or mad, your arms are crossed, your eyes are looking down. Use their behavior as your language, right? Whatever age it might be. And then for young kids that can't sit, don't know maybe frustrated or jealous or embarrassed or sad, say to them, is it more that you're sad or is it anger or frustration? They will, so give them the words at first. They will be able to say, well, what does it mean to be embarrassed again? So then describe it to them. That's us kind of explicitly teaching emotional intelligence. A great way to also explicitly teach it, use books, use movies. Uh, how must have Lisa felt when she went home without corduroy the first time? Because her mom just didn't let her buy corduroy. Anybody know the book corduroy? I love it. It's a great one. How do you think she felt? How must have Anna felt when Elsa wouldn't have talked to her for years? I mean, she closed her out. Use the things that they're watching. Just draw upon that to explicitly teach emotional intelligence. You know, Chrysanthemum on her first day of school, we talk a lot, we stop there, we think, oh gosh, how do you think Chrysanthemum must have felt when everybody was teasing her about her name? That is a great way to explicitly teach it. It's something that you're already doing, you're already reading books, you're watching shows, and you can use those characters. Talk about body signals. Another way to explicitly teach, talk about body signals that are related to emotions. Use yourself as an example. It was so cute. I, this was about a year and a half ago. I was speaking in chapel, and I've spoken in chapel a couple times at West Mount, but you know, it's a bigger audience, and I'm so used to teaching, and I adore my students. My classes are capped at 30 because it's West Mount, and it's small. And they go, oh, great, now it's 1,200, and all my peers were, you know, my colleagues were going, and my kids were coming too. One of the West Mount students who works with us babysitting said, oh, no, I'm going to totally bring them. And I was like, well, you better sit in the back because Maddie's like two and a half or three. Like, I'm not sure how that's going to go, but okay, that's all on you. But I remember that Kate said to me, Mama, do you have those somersaults in your belly right now? It's great. Use bodies. And I said, I actually totally do. And I said, so what am I going to do next? Now this is a precursor to what's to come. And so we took deep breaths together. And then, of course, I went in in power pose in the bathroom because that's another <laughs> great thing to do. <laughs> but she doesn't know the power pose. Actually, she does kind of know, but she knows. But it was so, so use your own body. Talk about it times when you're nervous. Yes, I get somersaults. Or when you're angry, it just, oh, I can feel it. I, my girls know, like, oh, yeah, when I'm stressed, I kind of just hold it my neck neck and in my shoulders, right? If I'm constantly grading or if I'm stressed about deadlines. So use your own body to let them know, yeah, sometimes our body, we feel emotions and we feel things, which by the way is so helpful because for so many kids, how do we know they often present with anxiety or depression is they just talk about my tummy aches. I don't know, I have such a headache, right? So if we can help them realize it also, our emotions are processed in our body and our somatic system, that can be really helpful. 
And then another way to explicitly teach it is just to know your own triggers. As parents, we truly are emotion coaches. So know that, so one, make sure you've done the work regarding your own kind of emotional intelligence. Know your triggers. Recognize what you bring to the interaction. Recognize what kind of type of day you've had, right, where you're at. Apologize. Let them hear you apologize to them, to your spouse, to your husbands when you've done something. They should definitely be hearing us say, oh, I'm sorry, you know what? I think my I was just really quick to raise my voice, and it's not even related to what you did. It's not even related to your room. I just have had a tough day. And so I'm kind of, let them hear that, right? So in that way, recognize what you bring to, to the interaction. We also know that in regards to being an emotion coach, it's really helpful to praise the effort. What I mean by that is saying things, even when there's more to be done, you, you know, you can kind of, and sometimes my tendency is to walk into a room and say, oh, the playroom is a mess again, as opposed to, Okay, I see that you guys have started to pick up. Thank you so much. Let's keep going, right? <laughs> I mean, praising the effort is a great thing because we know that children, <laughs> children act out when their emotions are not managed well. So they're more likely going to go in and throw things in the playroom if I kind of come in, oh, this is a mess again, what, you know. So if their emotions aren't handled well, that's when kids act out. So we need to be emotion coaches in that way by explicitly teaching it. Okay. Just a couple more, and these will be quicker. Value passion wherever you may find it. Sometimes you might need to redirect it, right? I mean, we, we really might need to redirect it in our kid who if they're passionate about throwing things and it's particularly at their other sibling or squeezing things, and we have to redirect it. Let's throw it this way. Let's get a punching bag or throw it into the pillow. Um, passion is a sign of EQ. Passion is a sign of emotional intelligence. We want passionate kids. It's a sign of emotional intelligence. So respond back with gusto when they're passionate about things. Spend quality time. Um, spend quality time with your kids, not quantity time. Quantity time, sure, can be great, but research shows over and over it's actually quality time, which means put away your phones, put away your computer screen, your iPad, your book, whatever it is. Don't be unloading the dishwasher as you're talking with them. Get down and spend kind of face-to-face -face time with them. Engage in play. Literally just 10 minutes a day. I know you guys are all, we have full schedules and there's lots of demands that are made of us. I say to some parents, 10 minutes a day with each kid, no interruptions, and do it and do something that they want to do. Engage at their level when you spend that 10 minutes, and you're not distracted. And really, I think we can all hear, okay, 10 minutes, I can do that. Even if you have four, does anybody have four or five kids? Four kids? Five. Okay, well, there, so that's 50 minutes for you, so that's getting close to an hour, but some days you can maybe do it in groups. I'll let you do that, right? Some days that are more packed, you can say, okay, I'm going to gonna split them up in two here and then three together, and then that's just 20 minutes. But the rest mess with maybe two, one, two, three kids, 10 minutes with each kid, quality time, no interruptions, literally builds the brain circuits, right? Um, and when we're truly present, when we're truly available, that is when we are communicating the language of love, when you're truly present and truly available. And I think today in our digital, multitasking, fast-paced, consumeristic, electronic culture, we're not really fully present like we used to be. I mean, we're just not. And so what does it look like to just leave your phone behind when you go to the park? You don't need it, right? I mean, let kids know you come first. That teaches them the language of love. Um, Dr. Tina Payne does really neat research on this that actually looks at when we spend quality time, how we are building the brain circuits for our kids and how amazing that is. And that when we do that, they actually have higher reflective parts of their prefrontal cortex, which also helps them calm down when they're overstimulated, simply by us spending quality time with them. The last two, you guys have probably heard me te talk about joining before. It's something that, it's what I call joining. I find it so incredibly important. It's listening empathetically and validating their feelings, right? So, oh man, it is so scary to be scared, right? As opposed to, oh, there's nothing to worry about. You're safe, honey. The doors are locked. You're safe. It's fine. Uh, Man, I don't like it when I'm embarrassed. I, it, it, getting embarrassed can be so, ugh, such a yucky feeling, can't it? Just do that first. Join with them before you jump to problem solving. We are so quick to problem solve. 
sometimes my husband actually will say to me, can you just treat me like a client for a second here? I just need to hear, oh, that stinks. I'm so sorry you were treated like that at work today, right? I mean, truly, I love when I'm like, oh, right, because I, I'm a quick to problem solve. I'm a fixer. I like to kind of, okay, like we can do this. I'm someone who's like, let's go. Let's figure this out. We do it not only with our kids. We certainly do it with our spouses as well, where they come home or they've said something. Think of your last disagreement or argument. We're so quick to either defend ourselves, say our position. What we really need to say is, oh man, I hear you saying that that was really hurtful when I blah, blah, blah. I didn't realize that I hurt you in that way. When we slow down the communication process, when we join and validate, the conversation goes so much better, truly. And so that's joining. And if we seek to understand our kids' behavior, they also will have higher emotional intelligence. They'll, they know that we're on their side. They also will come to us in the future, which is what we want. And then teach your children techniques. One of my favorites is belly breathing. So let's look at belly breathing, which I was saying earlier. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen this great little video about belly breathing. Um, this is after my daughter said, do you have somersaults? And she said, should we do some breathing? And so she was kind of, whoops, referring to this. Let's even get it to play. It's great for you to show this to kids. Sometimes the monster that's inside you is a monster that is mad. It's a monster who is angry. Whoops. Oh, I didn't want to pause it. But you can listen to even the words. There's a monster that's inside you, the monster that is mad. The monster. It's the monster who feels bad. When your monster wants to throw things and your monster wants to shout, there's a way to calm your monster and chill your inner monster out. you guys watch the rest just for sake of time but it's great to show that to kids and literally teach them that when you take a big inhale you put your hands on your belly big inhale your belly can go out and then you hold you know you kind of count to four for kids and then you exhale for four teaching them deep breathing we literally know that that technique is so simple it's good by the way for all of us it can be done anywhere people don't need to know that you're doing deep breathing and it literally changes kind of the circuits um, in your blood flow and then in your brain as well. So teaching them techniques, that's a great one to watch with them and have them do it super catchy as well so they'll appreciate and love it. Okay, and then lastly, this is my last um, comment about how do we cultivate emotional intelligence in our home is lastly repair. I think you guys have probably heard me talk about if you came, might have been a couple years ago, um, when I talked about attachment and I talk about reparation and it's something that is so incredibly important for all of us. We know that research shows, especially in the first year of life, and then it gets better each year, but in the first year of life, about 70% of our dance, our what I call our, I call it our dance, it's dyadic synchrony, our emotional dialogue is out of steps between a caregiver, a mother, and a newborn. So 70% of the time we're missing the mark, and that's a large percentage. Now it gets better over time because we've gotten more sleep, we know who this kid is, right? We've gotten to learn their temperament more. So that percentage isn't as high. And we could think, my gosh, 70% missing the mark, right? And it gets, once again, 50 or 30% of the time. That doesn't matter nearly as much as reparation does. Repair, repair, repair. Will you come back and will you make an attempt to whether that's saying I'm sorry or whether saying oh, I messed up and let me try to help and understand. So let me show you this really, um, I worked with Ed Tronic in Boston in my 20s when he was doing the still face experiment. And I remember at times seeing these parents Literally, after just, they were in the room and we had all this fancy equipment. This was back in the very late 90s, early 2000. And uh, his parents were so stressed. And I remember saying to Ed, what is the big deal? It's just two minutes. Of course, now I know as a parent why this was such a big deal. But let's watch this quick video on reparation and the still face. Keenly responsive to the emotions and the reactivity. Wait, did you get, let me start from the beginning. Babies this young are extremely responsive to 
the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. And the still fake experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I mean, like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, What's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother. Come on, what are you doing? Even in this two minutes when they don't get a normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. just conclude by saying once again what an amazing um, responsibility as well as privilege it is that we have the opportunity to be emotion coaches for our kids um, and we have the opportunity to help them kind of increase their EQ if you will and that is protective over their lifespan so um, the ways that I would say to just be mindful is to practice and model emotional attunement explicitly teach it to value passion, to spend quality time, to join with their emotion, to teach techniques, and then to practice reparation and repair often. Um, I will just end with this little quote from The Little Prince and say thanks so much for having me here once again. I think I'm about five, ten minutes over. So I don't know if there's time for Q&A, but you guys should probably, it's 1029, so you should go right, oh wait, and here are your questions for you. But you have them at your tables. So, to. yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe one or two questions. If someone's, yeah. just, if someone's just dying, to like ask something? <laughs> or can you wait and step on your table? Can I make, I, I want to ask a question about older kids a little yeah. bit. Because we have a few moms that, that yes. have, like, one of the things I'm working with Jordan specifically about is redirecting um, negativity, like yeah. going to that critical place. Yeah. But I don't want to um, not validate. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Like when they're older, yeah. How, how do you begin that process without yeah. it feeling like you're you're just hijacking them? Right. Yeah. It's a great great question. I mean, so essentially, first, so first, I would say join. So to say, ah, oh, you are angry, or you are mad, or you're just feeling like everyone's whatever out to get you, or this stinks. This teacher's giving you so much homework, and ugh, it stinks, and life's whatever it might be. So let them hear you say that and sit with that. And then, I mean, let him even so, you know, and, and, and match with gusto the emotion. And then let him kind of, one point, say, okay, well, what do we, that stinks, but what are we going to do about this? So use we language. Notice I didn't say, what are you going to do about it, or you need to change your attitude. What do 
I mean, what do you think we should do about it? And let them, maybe, you know, if Jordan can come up with a suggestion, or you could, you could say, because what I'm noticing, buddy, is it just seems like, I don't know if it's great or helpful for you to just walk around feeling like this stinks and school's hard and everything's just so negative. So I would, I would literally let him hear and say, I, you know, I, I care for you too much, and it just seems like there's a lot of ways in which you're just looking in the glasses, always half empty. So what do you think we, how can I help you? What can we do? And once again, saying, I want to acknowledge that that is hard. And you know what? Yeah, it's a bummer that you didn't get invited to that party or you weren't part of, you weren't, you were picked last for that soccer team or whatever it is. So let them once again say, I get it and it is hard and there are things that are going to be hard and we're going to feel bad about. And then say, but we do have a choice. We have a choice too in how we respond, right? We have a choice to either respond and say, okay. And that's where, and once again, I would use we language, like, you know, so we can say, yeah, this is hard, but I'm going to, I'm going to still say, it's all right. Like, there are things and I can do this and I'm okay and I've got help, I've got mom, you know, or I can kind of be stuck in this hard space and I'm the one who's mostly affected by that. I mean, so I would just name that and kind of name that at some point there's a choice that he has to make and then I would say, hey, which, where would you rather be? And then I would even at some point say, because you know what, buddy? I can even tell you that when you're in this negative space, you know how much I love you and I would do anything for you. But I don't really love being around you when you're this negative. And I'm just worried that some friends might not either. Natural consequences. I mean, truly. I mean, you know? And so, but I would, you got to really emphasize the joining. This is hard. This stinks. I've been there. Sit with that. That might be what you just do. That might just be all one day. You might not even get to the second part to the next day and say, you know, I just noticed, I know we talked about this last time. I guess I'd love to talk about, well, what do we do with it? Because I know you can't feel good about it. And guess what? It, Dad and I don't feel great about it either. And I don't think your friends are super attracted to it either, I mean, right? Because we all know, like, you can say, you don't really want to be around somebody who's a grumpy Gus, negative Nancy. Like, we want someone who's more of it, you know? And so I think all of that conversation and helping them think about it. Is that the answer? Is there a redo button? <laughs> yeah, yes, there's always opportunity for growth and for repair, no matter how old your kids are. Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, we make them all the time. I mean, that still face experiment. I mean, if you couldn't guess, Ed's Reductotronics research was, uh, and then came to be about postpartum depression. And so we would go into homes and we'd say, okay, like this is a real thing. And this mom is, she has a still face because she is so struggling. Her hormones aren't in balance. So, one, we've got to rally the troops. We've got to make sure there are other people around. And we also have to help because kids need that engagement. Because he found if they don't get it, there's a higher likelihood of ADHD later on. You can see because they're trying so hard, right? Even in that, for to like, what, me, don't forget about me. Wait, what are we doing here? And they lose posture. And then we actually see even later some correlation with ADD. It's almost like we need to educate ourselves first, yeah. which is what you're doing this morning yeah. to a lot of us. Um, and so then before we can pass it on and live it out right. to yeah. our kids. Yeah. So no, I, think it's, I, I think this is great to be able to well, present on this. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Really fast. Yeah, you have no, to. No, I defer to these guys because no, I already no, feel. No, I was no, supposed no, to be no, done no, by 10.25. No, no, Okay, you ask them. Turn to your tables. That's right, right? Let's, let's appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, and you have the, your questions on the tables. And just so you know, she is in town. She doesn't practice. So if there's something burning inside of you, you know, you can make it a point. Look at those eyes. I love it. Yeah. So go ahead. Now we've got like 25. 25. Shoot for 20. <laughs>